Okay, um, let's get started. It's this time of year, I always wonder whether the semester is too short um, or too long. Um, too short, um, yeah. Let's see, that's less kind of Charlton Heston mode. Um, too short, and that there's an awful lot that we could have covered and ought to have covered in this course that we haven't. Um, <clears throat> so at this point in the semester, I think, why is this a one semester course rather than a full year course? Uh, that is, there is models, there is institutional detail, there is policy. All three of these belong together. Um, and yet in this course, we teach mostly the models. It's a intermediate macroeconomic theory course, after all, with relatively little on the institutions and the policy. And if you get to another course where you do do institutions and policy, it's generally a year or a year and a half later when you're taking money and banking or international finance or the Romer and Romer advanced business cycles course. And by then, the models are so far buried in your conscious and buried in your long-term memory that we have to spend a lot of time redoing them. Well, if only we put those pieces of the curriculum together, maybe more of it would stick. Um, so on the one hand, I think the semester is too short. Uh, it'd be really nice to have 20 weeks, if not two semesters, to do all this stuff. Um, on the other hand, this week, and more so next week, when I look out at your faces, um, I see a certain glazed look uh, in your eyes, as in the semester has been too long already, and you can't wait for it to be over. The people at Stanford, um, both students and professors, say that their quarter system is vastly superior, that everyone reaches the ninth week of the quarter still fresh and eager to learn and full of vim and vigor and energy, uh, and that we really should move to their system. Um, I'm kind of skeptical. At least the times when I've been at Stanford, people in the last week of a quarter have looked exactly like you look in the last week um, of a semester. All right, so three more classes. Um, this class, um, this class is the um, kind of current macroeconomic situation class. This class is also the evaluations class. So is there a volunteer who I can give these things to who will then take them up to the IAS office at 101 Stevens Hall afterwards? You look brave. You're sitting in the front row. Uh, what? You don't? All right, you'll do it. Okay, thank you. And then Darius and I will scoot out of here at 1215 um, to give you time to do your evaluations and get them up there. Um, they're an imperfect tool, but they're an important tool in figuring out whether what we're teaching is what you like um, and need to learn. And we do take them very seriously um, here at Berkeley um, in trying to guide how we should shape the curriculum for the future. And God knows we need help in shaping the curriculum for the future right now, given the continuing decline in California's willingness to spend money on UC Berkeley, and thus given that UC Berkeley is going to have to reconfigure itself in a bunch of ways in the future. Um, the question is how, and the more information that gets to California Hall about how Berkeley should try to reconfigure itself for a future in which the state is less supportive of public education. The more information we get, the better. Um, problem set nine, the sample final is out. It's a problem set, so it's due April 28th at the start of class. Um, we're going to go over it in the final lecture next Thursday. Um, and on Tuesday, I'm going to give not the overview of the current situation, but instead the overview of all of the topics that we've covered, um, or at least supposedly covered in this course. And as I say, there are a lot of topics, um, and virtually all of these things, I'm going to try to test them all on the exam, at least once over lately, um, try to make it a comprehensive exam, but also a doable exam. Um, current macroeconomic situation. If you want to understand the state that the U.S. economy is in right now, the first thing to look at, I think, is the U.S. labor market. And the best statistic um, to look at for the U.S. labor market is the civilian employment to population ratio. Um, you know, the civilian to employment population ratio has three kinds of movements associated, or maybe four kinds. Mm, I'm starting to sound like uh, Monty Python. Um, five kinds of significant movements associated with it. <coughs> the first is the every year rise and fall of employment. Um, as the Christmas rush approaches on the one hand, and there are more people at work, um, as you get the post-Christmas slowdown and the shutdown of construction activity in the Northeast and the Midwest, um, you know, say a one half to one percentage point fluctuation in the employment to population ratio you know, with the seasons. Um, the second big thing to happen to the employment to population ratio since World War II has been feminism. Um, the entry of women into the labor market in very large numbers as we move into a society in which women who get married are no longer routinely fired from their jobs uh, because a married woman shouldn't be working, and in which women are overwhelmingly confined to the types of jobs you see them in on Mad Men. Right? Um, waitresses, hairdressers, secretaries, school teachers, um, a few others, laundresses, a very maids, a very few others, uh, but instead a genuine significant increase in equal opportunity. Um, the third thing that happens are these collapses in the employment to population ratio that take place during recessions. Um, recessions conveniently dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research's Business Cycle Dating Committee, on which our very own Christina and David Romer happen to serve. They're the people who decide what period of time counts as a recession. Um, Basically, the definition of a recession is almost, and I think should be, a collapse in the employment to population ratio. Um, then there are the two types of recoveries. Um, first, there is the relatively rapid recovery in the employment to population ratio that we saw after the Federal Reserve raises interest rates and fights inflation recessions that we saw during the first three decades of the post-World War II period or so. Um, in those movements, after the end of the recession, the employment to population ratio kind of bounces back up and bounces back up quickly to its pre-recession level. And then there's number five, uh, the kind of thing that seems to happen after a financial crisis um, caused recession. We saw this after the 1990 savings and loan crisis. Um, we saw this after the 2000 collapse of the dot-com bubble. Um, we're seeing this today. The recession ends. Right? It's no longer the case that the employment to population ratio is falling steeply month by month. Um, but the employment to population ratio does not grow or does not grow much for quite a while. And it does not start recovering to its previous normal level until something else, something new comes along to give the economy a boost. Um, the arrival of the dot-com boom in the 1990s. The arrival of the housing boom in the 2000s. And right now we're sitting here in... April of 2011, waiting for the next boom to come along, waiting for the next leading sector to come along, and looking forward at an employment to population ratio that doesn't seem to be going much of anywhere, uh, and certainly isn't going much of anywhere very quickly. Yesterday, President Barack Obama um, was at Facebook, um, talking to the employees of Facebook and selected others, and talking about how the recovery wasn't as strong as he would like to see, but how the U.S. economy had created 2 million private sector payroll jobs um, over the past kind of 18 months. Um, now, if you look at the number of 18 to 24-year-olds who enter the labor market, um, and if you look at the number of 62 to 70 year olds who retire from the labor market, and if you add up those numbers, you find that there are about 130,000 people, more people joining the labor force in any month as they are leaving. 
multiply 130,000 people per month by 18 months, and you get 2 million. Um, so that at least as far as the average worker is concerned, the average member of the labor force, the average adult is concerned, they have no greater chances of having a job today than they did 18 months ago. Uh, a more helpful and better framing of Obama's, the U.S. economy has created 2 million private sector payroll jobs over the next 18 months, would have been for him to say that the average American adult has no greater a chance of having a job today than he or she had at the trough of the business cycle when the recession came to an end. That as far as the labor market is concerned, we haven't had a recovery. Uh, we've had some growth in the economy because we have a larger population and hence a larger number of adults. That's pushed real GDP up. Uh, we've had a fair amount of technological and organizational progress over the past year and a half. The fact that we're in a recession has not stopped us from figuring out how to make our organizations better and how to apply new technology as well. Um, but um, and a recovery to normal levels of output um, or to normal levels of capacity utilization, it simply hasn't happened. And it really doesn't look likely to happen at any great pace in the future by the private sector's own, if the private sector undertakes its own processes um, of economic recovery. And this is so even though interest rates, um, even though interest rates are now more or less back to normal. Um, look at the DGS-10, okay, <coughs> DGS-10, um, that's what the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, um, the D is for daily, um, the G is for government, um, the S is for security, that is a bond, the 10 is for 10-year, DGS-10 is the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond daily price index, this shows the interest rate on the 10-year Treasury constant maturity bond, um, and itself a somewhat interesting concept because there actually is only a 10-year bond um, four times a year, um, you know, at most, that the Treasury issues bonds more or less once every quarter, and so most of the time there's a 9-year and 11-month or a 9-year and 10-month bond out there. Um, and so the U.S. Treasury has a complicated curve-fitting exercise that tries to report what the price of a 10-year U.S. Treasury bond would be if we were issuing a U.S. Treasury bond of exactly 10 years today. Um, Moody's, one of the investing, one of the rating agencies, Moody's Investor Services, also calculates what the value of a BAA bond, um, that is a corporate bond that's not the safest of corporations, but that's not a junk bond, that's not a really risky bond, um, is also. And I think this is actually a bad series to calculate, um, because one thing that happens in recessions is that Moody's marks the ratings of bonds down. A bond that was BAA will become BA, a bond that was BA will become B, um, a bond that was AAA will become AA or single A, so that these aren't the interest rates paid on a particular bunch of bonds. Um, the interest rates that a particular bunch of bonds have to pay go up by more, because bonds are downgraded during recessions um, and upgraded during expansions. But this shows what happens to the interest rates um, in the recession and after. During the recession, the flight to quality pushed the interest rate on U.S. Treasury securities way down um, and pushed the interest rate on corporate bonds way up. So as a result, a whole bunch of businesses decided that they did not want to boost their investment spending because it was so expensive to borrow. That was one of the things that caused the recession. Um, now both Treasury interest rates and BAA bond rates are more or less back to normal, um, are back to where they should be, uh, where they normally are. And yet the economy is still depressed. Um, and the reason the economy is still depressed is that even though um, bond prices and interest rates are back to normal, incomes are low. And because incomes are low, spending is low. And because spending is low, production and employment is low. And because production and employment is low, incomes are low, um, relative to what they would normally be in a full employment economy. And the U.S. economy appears to be stuck there, um, with no strong pressures coming from the private sector to push up employment um, and production. And even though there are an awful lot of workers out there looking for jobs who were profitably and productively employed in 2007, and who presumably could be profitably and productively employed again, and who would be willing to work for somewhat less than they were making in 2007. Now, being unemployed for years is not a fun process. Nevertheless, the private sector can't get its act together to put these people to work. Uh, the businesses are reluctant to hire because they don't think there's going to be demand. Uh, because they don't hire, incomes are low, and because incomes are low, there actually isn't uh, the demand. Um, and this is a great puzzle um, for us neoclassical economist types. Right? That is, um, Back at the start of the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes launched an intellectual frontal assault on what he called classical economics. Um, and classical economics' basic premise was the market works, but there are a bunch of frictions in the market. You know, wage rigidity, structural unemployment, um, you know, financial market imperfections caused by bankruptcy and moral hazard. Um, a bunch of frictions in the economy that mean it takes longer for the economy to re reach its equilibrium um, than we would like. And so the classical economist said there's a place for government intervention in the economy whenever the government can fix things faster than the private sector can fix a market failure or a disequilibrium. But that space is limited, um, and that space is temporary. Keynes's assault was based on the idea that the equilibrium restoring forces of the economy, at least as far as employment and production were concerned in business cycles, were very, very, very weak, um, were very, very weak indeed. Um, and then over the course of the first two post-World War II generations of economists, people looked at the U.S. economy and they looked at the speed of recovery from the recessions and they said, hey, um, the classical economists were pretty nearly right all along. That on average, the U.S. economy closes 40% of the gap between its current position and its full employment position in an average year after a recession comes to an end. Um, yes, there are lots of shocks in the economy that produce economic downturns, but once the shock passes, the equilibrium restoring forces of the economy are pretty darn strong. Um, and yet now, looking at history since 1990, um, it looks like that was a optimistic and a wrong judgment. What seems to have been right was that when a recession is caused by a Federal Reserve raising interest rates in order to reduce the rate of inflation, then once the Federal Reserve decides it's done enough to reduce inflation, then recovery is rapid, and recovery is rapid because the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates by a lot. Um, but, but when you have a recession that's not generated by a Federal Reserve decision to fight inflation and raise interest rates, when you have a downturn that comes from, from some other context, then it really looks like John Maynard Keynes was right and that the private economy won't push itself back to full employment with any significant speed at all. <coughs> you either have to wait until a new positive shock hits the economy, um, a wave of rational or irrational exuberance of businesses getting excited about the dot-com sector or excited about mortgage loans or something, um, or you have to wait for the government, um, for the government to actively take steps to do something extra to boost demand. And after a financial crisis recession, the fact that the short-term nominal interest rates are close to zero means the Federal Reserve really can't do very much through its normal policies to lower short-term nominal safe interest rates very much, and that the normal tool that we use to try to get the government to boost aggregate demand doesn't work um, or doesn't work well. Mm. And labor market interest rates, 
And so this is where we are with real GDP. Right? But, um, as best we can see, we've simply had this 6% fall in real GDP relative to its growing pre-2008 trend. And we're not making up um, that gap between where we are now and where the previous trend was. Um, we're really not making up that gap at all, especially after the number for first quarter GDP growth comes out later on this month. Um, it looks like the number for the first quarter will, will be that it certainly won't be 13.6 trillion uh, dollars of real GDP. Um, it may not even be 13.5 trillion um, of real GDP. You know, the, the next line segment to be added to the blue line at the end is going to be something that's almost flat. You know, the first quarter of 2011 <coughs> is coming in as a quarter of economic growth, uh, but as a quarter of economic growth at a pace perhaps half as fast as during this period here. Um, so, um, and it's doing this, um, I'm doing this in spite of the fact that even long-run inflation expectations remain well contained. Um, the gap between these two lines, right, which are the 10-year Treasury constant maturity rate and the interest rate on the 10-year Treasury bond that's indexed for inflation, um, that pays you its interest rate and also pays you enough money to compensate for the erosion of your principal via inflation. Uh, the gap between those two interest rates is a good measure of what the market expects the inflation rate to be over the next 10 years. And in general, the market expects that to be about 2.5%, or expected that to be about 2.5% in the mid-2000s. Um, then you get a bunch of interesting moves in the expected inflation rate during the recession itself. And since then, the expected inflation rate over the next 10 years has gone back to its normal pre-2008 level of about 2.5% per year expected inflation over the next 10 years. Um, you could understand a government that was unwilling to do much to boost aggregate demand if the market was telling it that expected inflation was high. Um, if the market was telling the government that expected inflation was high, a government that values the low inflation rate as a means of making the price system work well might well say we can't afford to stimulate the economy by boosting aggregate demand. We'll do more damage to the ability of the price system to successfully allocate resources through inflation. If we do that, then we'll gain by higher employment and production. Uh, but that's not there. And if those two lines were moving apart much more rapidly, um, I could understand saying that priority one of the U.S. government should be to reduce its long-term deficit, because fears that a deficit will lead to money printing are becoming an important part of the, economic, um, of the economic configuration, and we really don't want people to think that the U.S. government might start paying its bills not by taxing, but by simply printing out lots of money. That leads you to a very generous place. You know, we're not there um, at all either. That looking at expected inflation rates, there's no reason to think that the U.S. should be more, less willing to boost monetary policy to boost production if it needs it, if unemployment is high than it was in the mid-2000s. No reason to think the U.S. government should be less willing to take on additional debt um, than it was in the mid-2000s. Surely at some point, these lines will start moving apart. And at that point, I will stand up here and say that there really is no space for further expansionary fiscal and monetary policy without risking um, a bad macroeconomic outcome because of a rapid rise in inflation. Um, we're not there now. Um, and yet when Barack Obama goes to Facebook, um, you know, he says that, well, that... Um, <coughs> If we don't have a serious plan to tackle the debt and the deficit, that could actually end up being a bigger drag on the economy than anything else. If the markets start feeling that we're not serious about the problem, then they could pull back right at the time when the economy is taking off. Um, but, you know, the economy is not taking off, and there are no signs at all that this is what this future um, of exploding debt and deficits being a drag on the economy um, is what the market is worried about. Um, one comment on this kind of presentation at the Facebook town hall yesterday is that this sounds like Obama being much less coherent than he usually is which people say makes them hope that he's at least undecided about whether we should be pursuing further expansionary policies, um, rather than being in his usual highly articulate pr professorial rhetorical mode, in which he's absolutely certain about what the policy should be and why it's the right policy. That he has an established way of talking um, when he knows what he wants to do, right? Which is kind of that some say we should surrender to the Russians, um, others say we should launch a thermonuclear war. I reject both those extremes. By contrast, I think the best policy is X, Y, Z, and W. Right? That's Obama's standard rhetorical mode, right? to bash the unrealistic right, to bash the unrealistic left, to cling to the technocratic center, and to produce an extremely coherent um, and thoughtful discussion of what's happening um, and what right-to-right policy should be. Um, that's not what we saw at Facebook yesterday, and I think that at least is interesting. Um, now, even though the United States economy is not in great shape, um, it's in better shape, I think, than the economy of Western Europe. Um, here we look at the level of real GDP in the largest economy in Western Europe, um, the central economy of Western Europe, the 80 billion inhabitants of the Federal Republic of Germany, um, the richest and most prosperous and most dynamic industrial exporting nation in Europe. Um, and we look at real GDP, and we see a bunch of reasons to be kind of grateful um, that we live in the United States. The first of which is that European growth is usually more hesitant than growth in the United States. You have this period from 2001 to 2005, which wasn't really a recession, but in which German output wasn't growing at all, uh, before you have this three-year boom from 2005 to 2008, during which German output grows by, you know, say, 525,000 to 570,000, um, grows by 45 over 520, um, goes by 9% over three years, grows at a 3% per year rate. Um, that 3% per year rate that Germany sees between 2005 and 2008 is about what the United States on sees on average between 2001 um, and 2008. Put Germany and the U.S. on kind of the same axes um, so that you can see relative rates of growth in the U.S. in 2001 would be down here. Um, so that German growth in the you know, 2000s was relatively sluggish and hesitant. And while some of that was a lower rate of growth of Germany's population, there are a lot of people moving into Germany from poorer parts of the European Union or people who would be moving into Germany from poorer parts of the European Union if 